what I thought I'd do is I'd, I'd do a quick, of, quick run through on the changes since we last had an update, which I think was version 46. And so go through all the changes since then. And if necessary, I'm happy to hang around and answer questions that people might have. Um, so I'm going to do them kind of in uh, chronological order based on the releases. I've cut down the readme file here. These are the things which I thought were somewhat significant. So there's just about a page of them. And um, we'll start at the bottom with uh, value curves, definable presets. Um, this here's version 50. You can tell it's version 50 because it looks like yours looks like. Um, we'll create a quick sequence here. Just an animation is all we need. Um, uh, this is my place. It doesn't really matter. So there's, there's a couple of things you'll notice here. Uh, you'll notice that there's now these coloured boxes that appear on some of the models. Um, these appear only when the model is a single colour model. So uh, these green bauble outlines are some white surrounds that surround some baubles that sit in my window. Uh, they happen to be set up as white strings. If I go to my layout um, and find one of them up here, um, here it is, it's one of the outlines. You can see if you go down to string properties that it's a single color and it's white. And so consequently, when you're in the sequencer, it shows that it's white here. This one's obviously blue and this one's red, etc. So it's an extra hint. Um, a lot of people struggle with uh, single colors and, and don't quite understand how they work. Um, but let me, let me give you an example because some people don't really understand this. If I put an on effect onto this thing here, which is green, and this is currently set to be color white, and you'll notice that when it's set to color white, it shows up as green. If I was to set it to color red, it would be off. If I was to set it to color green, it would show green. Um, and the reason for that is it's just looking at the green channel and it's showing um, the greenness of it. And so when white is shown, white obviously contains green and so it's on. Um, not surprisingly, if I show yellow, of course, yellow does contain green, so it stays on as well. Um, whereas uh, magenta is a mixture of red and blue, and so there's no green channel, so you don't see it come on at all uh, with the on effect. And so having the colour here kind of gives you that visual clue which reminds you. Um, this magenta colour, I use magenta colour when I've got a really non-standard uh, dumb string, like a multicoloured string or something, and magenta is my hint that this is a, a really weird colour. Um, but generally speaking, I only use on effects on them and I only ever turn them on white because that's, you know when you're using one of these dumb strings, if you put a white on it, it's always going to light up um, all the time. We're talking about value curves, so um, let's go and grab something that's got a value curve, and the best one's obviously uh, Gill's fill effect, um, this one. And we'll pick something, uh, actually, uh, let me go down. Sorry, I'm still learning my layout for this year. There's just so many damn things here. Um, I'll find my tree. Arch tree, there it is. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw um, it on there. Uh, everyone, rem oh, sorry, I was going to do the fill effect. We'll drop the fill effect on there. Uh, it's on 100. Obviously, I can slide it up and down. Uh, the value curve icons change to make it a little bit easier to see when it's on or not. Um, and one of the things that we've added here is the ability to create presets. So, for instance, I could go into here um, uh, and create a sine wave and then I'll go to custom because then I can edit it um, and so I can go here and I can change this around a little bit and then I can export it and when I export it it exports uh, as a value curve file um, which I can call temp and saves it and you get the image of that value curve there and so if I just want to grab one of my previously defined value curves I can just click on it down here and reuse it so if you come up with a value curve that's useful and you want to continually reuse it all over the place um, you can export it um, and it will save it and that's a really quick way to go and reaccess that value curve anytime that you want um, the seven segment bitmap um, I, I added 
added this some time ago, um, but in 46, but then I screwed it up, so it was broken. Um, so in the state effect here, there's this seven segment display thing, which, uh, which helps you by pre-populating all these states with the typical states that you'd want to have if you were doing a seven segment display. And so when you click on it, it gives you this sort of image here, which shows you a seven segment display and you can choose what sort of part, what parts of the seven segment play you want to use. So if you've just got a seven segment display that just has uh, these two digits here, um, you just select these two. If you wanted the the, col the decimal point, you you do that one. Uh, this one here's the colon. So if you had the colon and so on, and then it will go when you click OK, it would go in and generate all of these states here that represent the sort of states that you need to have to then go and use the state effect to do things like countdown clocks and things like that. Um, so the seven segment display just helps someone get that set up. Okay, uh, Dan put the currently open sequence name in. The, I haven't saved this sequence, but if I was to save um, my sequence here as XXX, um, it's meant to put it up in the title bar. Not sure why that didn't work. Oh, open it. So. Okay, yeah, so here when I've opened one up, it's showing up here, the XML file that it's opened. Uh, Submodels to tree on layout page. So what this means is on the layout page here, uh, if you have some submodels, uh, so as I do here with my star, for instance, um, I went through and defined uh, these submodels here, with the little submarines. Um, against them and so it just shows what the submodels are and what the start channels and the like are for them. Uh, match duration effect alignment option. So that's in the sequencer. So if I go down here and, and as you all know by now, if you don't have any timing tracks selected, um, you can come down to here and, and you can do uh, things like, so I stretch this one out. So I can go here and highlight these three and if I right click on it, uh, there's some additional alignment things like um, matching. The reason it didn't like that is because I didn't actually single click on something. So I can do things like um, a match duration. And so what it's done is it stretched all those effects out and made them as exactly as long as that. Um, the reason it didn't work the first time I did it is if you grab this and if you just do a, a drag, it's highlighted the three of them, but it hasn't actually selected one as a primary. You actually uh, need to hold the control key down click to unselect one and then click again to select one. And now when you right click on it, you can do alignment and so I could align the start times. Alignment, align start, no, why did that not work? Alignment, match duration. Okay, I'm not sure why the start times didn't align, but the match duration and so it goes through and does that. Uh, the sequence checker, by now I'm hoping that all of you have uh, started to play or have run the sequence checker at least once. Um, it's up here on the tools menu, check sequence. Uh, if you run it, it goes through and it scans your, uh, all of your model setup or your network setup and whatever sequence that you have open and it goes through and looks for and tries to highlight things that create issues. Um, if you get warnings, that means that uh, it could cause problems, but there are good reasons why you may choose to do it, so it only warns you about it. Um, it may also give you errors. Um, if it gives you an error, basically you, you should be fixing it because the error, is things that are highlighted as errors can never do good things. It, it will never work the way you might have thought it was going to work, and so you need to go and fix it. Um, let me walk you through what each one of these are though to help you understand what they are. So the first thing we do is we tell you which IP address um, 
uh, you're going to be outputting data to. Um, if you're like me and you've got both a wired connection and a wireless connection, um, and you typically connect to your, your home internet by um, the wireless, but then you're plugging directly into a controller or something to control it, um, sometimes x lights chooses the wrong output. It chooses to connect to your, your Wi-Fi and, and, and the internet rather than connecting to your controller and you, you're running x lights and trying to see the data come out and, and nothing happens. And that's because it's sending the data the wrong way and often you have to turn the network um, off, like your Wi-Fi off in order to uh, get it to work correctly. So this here is telling you which, which IP address it's going to be sending data out and you can then go and check whether that what IP what controller that IP address is allocated to, which will help you understand whether the data is going the right right way. Um, inactive outputs, um, you'd, you'd all no doubt remember uh, that you can enable and disable uh, controllers here. Um, in up to version 50, if you double click on one of these, it will actually inactivate it or uh, like that or reactivate it. Um, and people would sometimes accidentally inactivate them and then wonder why that data wasn't being sent out. So this just flags as warnings because it's a perfectly valid thing to do, any controllers that you might have inactivated. Um, overlapping model channels, um, this goes through and highlights um, any potential overlaps that you might have between models. Now, th these ones here are actually all legitimate. These are all intentional uh, model overlaps where I have shadow models, uh, but sometimes you don't actually mean to have the overlaps that you have, and so you need to go through this list and make sure that you're comfortable that all of these are okay. Um, having models with overlapping channels, and when I first ran it, I actually did have some problems. Um, what can happen is you can get some, some strange uh, data coming out, you know, uh, models turning on at times when you didn't expect them to turn on because of these overlapping channels. Um, model nodes are uh, not allocated to layers correctly. Um, the most common reason that this happens is uh, you might have something like a star with uh, multiple layers. Um, I actually don't have a, a regular star here with multiple layers. Um, but if you, if you remember the star effect, uh, where you can go in and you can say, um, oh, there's uh, 20, uh, 10, and 5 um, stars. Well, you can see that that actually only accounts for 35 um, nodes, yet I've said the string is 50 long. And so if you've got any of those circumstances, uh, they're going to get listed here as, as being this mismatch where you haven't allocated the right number of layers. Um, happens to stars and circle models. Um, so it'll catch those problems. Uh, custom models with odd looking channels. So this will find things like custom models where you haven't actually entered any nodes at all. You haven't actually gone into the layout and put any um, uh, node numbers in or situations where you've gone and you've put in a whole bunch of numbers but you've accidentally left a gap, you've forgotten a number. Um, and so this will find any of those gaps and highlight them for you and you can go in and fix them up. Um, model groups create containing models from uh, different previews. For those of you that use these, these different previews up here, if you have a model group which you've put into, um, into uh, this uh, default um, preview and it includes a model which is normally in the unassigned preview, then it will cause that model to appear in the default, even though it's not actually assigned to the default, and that creates confusion. And so uh, any situations where you've done that, they'll be highlighted here. Um, models slash model groups without distinct names. Um, I think that looks for, for name clashes. I think that's what it does. I, I, I wouldn't swear by it. I'd have to go back and look at the code. Um, model groups containing other models or groups or non-existent models. Um, so uh, once again, this should never happen, but every now and then as a result of uh, some older sequences, it's occasionally possible that you've got a model group um, uh, which had the same name as a model and, uh, because we weren't really good at preventing those and that causes all sorts of anomalies to occur. Um, and so this will go through and we'll find any of those. If you're not upgrading some old sequences, it's very unlikely to find any problems there. Um, render mode. 
Um, this one caught me out. In fact, this was the one that triggered the whole thing being written. Um, there are certain render modes that don't make a lot of sense, particularly with things like um, custom models with faces, etc. Um, and so this will go through and it will spot any situations where you've put an effect on a, um, a model and used a render mode that's a very unlikely to work as you expect it to work. And so it will flag any of those for you. Um, the media file. So this will go and check that the media file that you've associated with your sequence looks okay um, and is likely to work. Um, Auto save, this will go and check the size of your sequence. And if you've got a really large sequence, typically because you've done something like um, imported an LSP or an LOR or a Vixen sequence, and it's really, really big because you've got lots of very, very low level effects uh, that you've imported, um, you end up with a really large XML file. And if you've got auto save that's set to be every three minutes and you've got a, a, a sequence file that is, um, several megabytes, what you'll find is that x -Lights will periodically pause while it does the autosave, and that gets really annoying really quickly. Um, and so this will go through and has some smarts to look at your, uh, your uh, sequence size and make a recommendation if maybe you should reduce the frequency of your autosave. Um, models hidden by effects on groups. By default, you should generally speaking, um, uh, have your model groups at the top. This is, this is a sequence from last year, so I haven't really done that very well. But if you, if you have your model groups at the top and your models at the bottom, then you tend to get the sort of behavior you expect. So if you drop an effect on the model, it overrides the group, um, which is exactly what you'd expect it to do. But if you put a model group down the bottom and a model up the top and you drop something onto the model and then you drop something on the model group, the model group will override the model and it often leads to confusion where people say, I don't understand what's going on. Why am I getting this on this model? I didn't put it there. And, and that's commonly the reason. And so we flag any of these situations as warnings. Um, it may not actually cause you any problems or you may even mean to do it, um, but it can cause problems. So we flag it as a warning. Um, effect problems. Uh, so uh, there's a whole bunch of very specific effect uh, challenges that this thing looks for. Uh, so it will look for things like um, here I've got some effects that actually run past the end of the sequence. Um, it will also spot uh, things like uh, a sequence where uh, the fade in and fade out uh, transitions uh, are longer than the actual effect, which means that the effect will never get bright or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, so there's a whole bunch of very specific things. It'll also spot things like um, uh, missing image files, missing video files. Uh, if you're doing uh, an x -Lights import from someone else's sequence, uh, this can be really useful because it will go through and tell you if any of the image files or whatever else didn't come in correctly and therefore won't work. Um, and it's a much faster way to find problems and sequences than, um, than going and looking at it manually. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Um, it keeps getting added to, um, I think there's even a few more things that are, it will be in 51. This is the 51. Um, if I go to, this is, this is 51, it's green because um, I, um, I use that to make sure I know uh, uh, that it's actually a, the pre-release version so I can run two things at once. Um, yeah, I'm not sure there's anything else there that's particularly new. So that's our uh, check sequence. Uh, definitely suggest you do it. If you ever have a problem, if you ever get a behavior you don't expect, quickly run check sequence, see if it tells you. Artnet support. So this came, I think it was in uh, version 50. You can now add a Artnet controller. Um, uh, you need to specify an IP address. Um, there's two different ways to specify the universe. ArtNet has this concept of network, subnet and universe. Um, it, it actually just ends up turning into a number. Um, and so some people just use a, an overall universe number, which is really just these things all broken up. So if I was to make all of these a one, and flick over to the universe only, that's actually universe 273. So there's a couple of different ways. Um, 
uh, just like E131, you get to specify how many channels and you get to specify a description. Um, and it should then work. Um, the other thing is there is the ability to turn on frame sync. So if you go up here and turn on frame sync, um, if you're using ArtNet, uh, it will actually send out synchronization packets. Um, uh, so what, will, what it will do is it will send out all the packets to all your ArtNet controllers. And it, when it's sent the last packet out to all the ArtNet controllers, it will then broadcast out a sync packet to the ArtNet controllers, which in theory, if your controller is fully compliant with the synchronization spec, will cause them all to then implement that packet, uh, that data at the same time and get enhanced um, uh, synchronization. Uh, there's also uh, E131 sync. Um, so uh, the new, not quite yet um, uh, ratified E131 spec has a, a, also a synchronization capability. And here you just need to define a universe which you uh, don't otherwise use um, for anything else. Um, and define that on each of your controllers to say that this is going to be the sync universe. Do you need to do that? No, you don't need to do that because what I do is, is when the packet gets sent out to the E131 uh, controller, it includes a, a, a note to say that this will be the sync universe. And if you've got a controller which supports the E131 sync spec, it should then wait to see a packet come out uh, to synchronize uh, that controller. To my knowledge, none of the controllers yet support this, but I know at least Dave Pitts was talking about including this on the Falcon controller. Um, it would only need to be a firmware upgrade at some point uh, should Dave uh, decide to do it. Um, by default, that's turned off just to avoid confusion because for most people, you're not going to be using it. Definitely not this year. Um, palette quick sets. Um, so there was a couple of changes we made to uh, palettes. Um, one thing that people had asked for was, um, you know, if you've got this palette here, what you might want to do is actually save that palette. Um, so, uh, you know, I might then switch to uh, another effect here. I don't know, I'll find another one somewhere. You know, this one here. No, it's not very different, is it? They're all very similar. Oh, yeah, that's a different one. Um, and then you, you go and you drop, I don't know, something else on. And you say, actually, I, I, that's not the colour palette I want. Um, so those two palettes that I've saved now sit in here. And so I can do a very quick change to that palette. What it won't do is it won't set your tick marks. You need to go in then and choose which colours you want to use. But if you've got a couple of palettes that you commonly use across things um, and, and you just want to be able to quickly uh, apply them up here rather than having to click and change each one. Uh, if you use colour curves, uh, remember the right click on, the, on these to go and define a colour curve. What are we doing? Um, so if I was to define a colour curve there, um, again, I could save that and uh, that colour curve is down here. So those colour curves are also included in those palettes. Um, so some quick ways to get at it. Um, this one, so if I wanted to delete this one, I just highlight it here so it's here and then I click the X and it deletes it uh, from the presets. Um, there's also this reverse palette here. So if I want to quickly reverse this palette, so it starts, goes black, red, black, blue. So now the black, red, black, blue is at the back. So it just flips it around. And that could be useful if you're doing, I don't know, some backward and forward type motions and you're dropping the effects and you want to flip the palettes backwards and forwards. It's a really easy way to do that. Uh, random color curves. Um, uh, most typically people uh, use uh, very simple uh, gradients. Um, there's also the none option, which lets you go and say, um, it does a hard color change at a certain point in time. I'll come to your question in just a second. Uh, but there's also a random. And what this lets you do is you choose two different colors and it will then randomly choose colors between those two colors and give you a, a really random distribution. Um, I threw this in place for things like, um, you know, if you want a flickering candle, you could make it you know, yellow and, and orange or something and it would rapidly color change randomly over the duration of the time interval, uh, which can produce some interesting effects. 
Um, so yeah, all right, there's a question. Is there a return to default colors? No, but what you can do is you can go in and um, save the default palette first time and then it will always be there. Um, so you can always go and get it back. Uh, that was the random color curve. Oh, uh, shift and double click. Uh, when you're doing um, uh, uh, when you're doing faces, I often find myself wanting to um, uh, to just play that section. And so, if you hold the shift key down and double click on an effect, what it will do is it will highlight for you the portion of the waveform that corresponds to the duration of that effect. And so, uh, you can come up here and whoa. That was loud. Um, so you can go there and do looping and, and whatever else. So uh, it's a very quick way to choose uh, various durations of the effect. Uh, it also works with your timing tracks. So if you go shift and double click on uh, a, a part of your timing track, it will highlight the piece of uh, uh, the waveform that that timing track represents as well. All right, uh, free model description. Okay, uh, I've, I use this a little bit. So uh, one of the things that we've added here is this description field. And so you can type anything that you want in here. You can say this is on output five of my controller, or you might want to say this has got a red cable tie on it, right? Or you may want to say I've tested this for 2016 and it's looking good um, and it just saves that data it doesn't use it for anything it just lets you record data so if you normally have a spreadsheet where you you type in some details about your model um, to keep track of things this gives you an alternate and if you go up to tools and export models um, and we go and create a file help if right so if I was to go into my folder uh, and export all of my models uh, those descriptions are, are all stored here and so you can see I've, I've been keeping track of which can, which models or which controllers I've been testing so far this year. Um, here's that star that we added and it just records those details in there along with all the other details about start channels and which controllers these things are on. Uh, this also includes my descriptions for my controller files and everything else. So this is pretty much your spreadsheet exported from x -Lights. Well, it's definitely my spreadsheet. Um, oh, add star to the ripple effect. All right, so uh, the ripple effect here, if you drop that, um, you can obviously do the circles and everything else. Uh, we added a star model. So now you can have a, a, a star ripple out um, on there. Uh, I think I also changed the VU meter and uh, where you have the level shape, um, this this also has now a, a star. It's a little bit on the big side, but there it is. Uh, and you can, I think uh, this one up here lets you control the number of points on the star or something. Sensitivity, maybe. Yeah. So yeah, you can change. Uh, you change the number of points on the star. Change it down to a five-pointed star and things like that. So yeah, that's that's all new there as well. Show waveform selected duration. Okay. So you see here, I've got the waveform selected. Over here, it tells me that I've chose. I've selected twenty-one point two seconds of the waveform. Um, so sometimes that's useful when you're um, uh, when you're trying to edit things out or you're, you're doing some timing, etc., as to know how much of the waveform you've chosen can be useful. Uh, mouth hints to faces dialog. Okay, so in the layout, uh, I've got my faces here. If I can click through far enough, 
Okay, and we go into our uh, faces data. Um, what I've done is I've placed alongside here each of the phenomes, uh, the uh, little images that represent the mouth shapes for the phenomes. So when you're sitting there and you're trying to work out, have I got the right mouth shape for an O? Uh, you can see that an O should be a large circle and yes, I've managed to select a large circle and it looks like the best pixels that I could use. Uh, for the E, um, I've used that mid-size. Could I make it bigger? I could, I've used that for the L, um, but it saves you having to have a separate reference sheet to go and look up to work out which pixels to highlight for your faces. Um, I think it, it does the same for all of them. So uh, even when you're doing the matrices, it still shows you what those images are uh, to make your life a little bit easier and save you having to flip backwards and forwards. Uh, we've shown you that one. We've talked about that one. Uh, value curves on the shockwave fan and morph effects. So these were changes that Gil introduced. Um, I, he, he published some actual videos on this stuff. So it's, I probably don't need to spend a great deal of time on it, but the fan, the galaxy, and the morph effects uh, are the superstar-like uh, things that, uh, that Gil built. Um, and he's gone and added the value curves to many of the parameters. Um, and there was one of the Wednesday night uh, uh, Zoom conferences in the States, which was recorded where Gil spent a bit of time going through and showing how to use each of these um, yeah, we've all done value curves before, so I'm not going to go in and demonstrate them, but basically almost all the parameters here, he's gone and added value curves to. Um, so you can get some pretty interesting effects with them now, particularly with morph. Um, change the default model back to minimal grid. What Gil means by that is that when you create a model group, um, most people don't necessarily realize it, but there is a, uh, there is a default layout model um, and there is a minimal grid and he's changed the default back to that. Um, that can be, that's useful because it limits the size of the, the underlying matrix because what happens in X-Lights is behind the scenes, all of those yellow highlighted uh, pixels are all being overlaid onto a grid and a minimal grid tries to build the smallest possible grid to represent that. And that's generally speaking, the better way to do it. Uh, blend modes, uh, additive, subtractive, minimax blend modes. Uh, what uh, um, what Dan is talking about there is uh, the oops. So he's added some additional uh, blend modes here that uh, bring things together. Um, so maximum will take the maximum brightness for each pixel uh, across the, the current layer that it's on and the layer below it. Minimum will take the minimum. Uh, subtractive subtracts, I think it subtracts the top layer from the bottom layer and additive adds the two layers together in some way. So it's, it's just another way to combine layers um, as usual spend a bit of time, play with them. That's the best thing to do. Um, add effect descriptions and effect export to, oh, okay. So actually there's a couple of things I've done here. I'll, this will be the last thing I'll do. So one of the things I added to this is you now get some stats at the bottom here, such as here's the number of models that you have in your sequence. Uh, this is the first channel that you've used. This is the last, uh, channel that you've defined, but this one here is the last actual channel that you've used. Um, so this is because I've defined more controller channels than I've actually used. And bulbs is a calculation that tries to work out how many lights I've actually defined. This can be a little bit skewed by things like dumb strings where unless you've modeled that accurately, obviously it won't count the bulbs correctly, but it will do things like count your pixels correctly and give you a fairly accurate representation of just how big your display is, help you make your tag in uh, oh, Christmas lighting a little bit more accurate. Effect descriptions. Okay, so this one came about as, uh, oh, sorry, wrong one. 
Let's go back to my other one. So this came about um, due to a request from uh, from one of the guys, uh, Matt Johnson in the States. Um, he wanted to be able to uh, put a description alongside an effect and so like create a tag on an effect uh, so that he could uh, basically collect some metrics um, uh, around his, his sequence. So you know, he can go and put a code or something on it um, or even select a handful of them and go in and say, oh, I don't know, call it GGG, and go and, 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 and put various uh, data against each one of these. And then he wanted to be able to go up and do an export effects. Um, what this does, which may or may not be useful to you, I'd help if I was in the right folder. So what it does is it, it basically exports all of the effects, their start time, the duration. Um, if you've gone in and put a description against it, it will include the description. It'll tell you what the effect is on and the type of that effect. Um, but interestingly, it also at the bottom here gives you a summary of your, um, uh, of your sequence. So it will tell you that I've used the bars effect 34 times in my sequence and it runs for a total of 2 minutes and 21.9 seconds. And so you can see how skewed your, your, your um, or how much diversity or, or whatever there is in your effect usage. Um, I, I don't think a lot of people are going to get a great deal of use out of it, but in, in Matt's case, um, he was looking to, he's doing some commercial stuff and was looking to balance the use of his uh, effects um, uh, across the sequence and wanted a way to be able to look at that data and filter it and sort it and all of that sort of stuff. So that was that one. Um, Add key model stats, we talked about that. Uh, garlands on the tree, make that optional. All right, so for a long time, there's been a, an effect here which hardly anyone uses called the tree effect. Okay, um, you typically would use green rather than red. And what it lets you do, um, and by default, this is how it would have worked. So we can throw in some more branches, but it used to have this stuff that used to come across these like tree lights that would come across randomly, etc. And you know, this actually doesn't look too bad when it's on a on a big model like a like a giant tree, etc. It can actually look a little bit like a layered tree. But these tree lights were annoying me, and so I made that entirely optional. Um, so now you can turn them off and just have a static tree and then you can overlay some images or some baubles or something else, I don't know, whatever it is you want to do. Uh, Multi-layer insertion. Um, I don't know, if, you, if, you, if you're someone like uh, uh, Steve Giron with his, uh, all of his presets with 27 different layers, going in here and inserting a layer and doing that 27 times got very tedious very quickly. Um, so now there's an insert multiple layers where you can go in and say, I want 15 layers and it just inserted 15 layers. So if you're using multiple layers a bit, uh, using your presets and saving things with lots and lots of layers. This makes it so much faster to insert the layers you need to then go and paste your effects in. Uh, we've talked about palette reversal and deletion. Um, common web resources. So uh, this is just some shortcuts to things like um, uh, the forum will take you to the Nutcracker forum. Um, a download will take you to the XLights download page, including the manual and the latest versions and the like. Uh, release notes will show you the readme.txt file. Actually, I don't think that was new. I think that was always there. Uh, the issue tracker will take you to the GitHub site with all the issues, so you can lodge any bug reports, etc. cetera. Um, and Facebook will take you to the official um, XLights support group. Um, and if you're not a member of that support group, I suggest you get yourself there because there's an awful lot of stuff uh, that's available. 
um, there that's definitely worth knowing. So yeah, so rather than having people know what those things are, these are now all here as, as, as easy to get to shortcuts. Uh, fickle contrast on oversized sub buffer. Okay. Um, yeah, this this used this background here used to be light grey. Um, what some people don't realise is that you can actually, when you're doing the sub buffer. So for those that remember, the sub buffer lets you limit how far the effect goes. Well, you can actually take the sub buffer up beyond the size of uh, your effect. Um, and that can generate some interesting outcomes. Um, but it got very hard to read because this was a light grey and now it's a dark grey and it's easy to read. Import effects and export of effects, remember the last type used. So if you're doing import, import effects, uh, this used to always default to the first. Um, because I most commonly when I do importing, I, I import an X light sequence, it's now remembered that. And so it's a one set of clicks. Same when you do an export, if you're exporting a, um, a model um, and, and you've chosen to do it as a, you know, an uncompressed video or something, uh, it will remember that. And next time it comes in and you do an export, it'll assume you want to do it to the same format. Uh, fixing animated GIF files. Uh, I don't know how many of you use animated GIFs uh, for images using the picture effect. Um, they used to work, um, but only a handful. There was a whole bunch of them that would generate all sorts of weird behavior. The image would jump around. Uh, you get partial rendering of images and it just all looked bad. Um, that's all been fixed. It was somewhat fixed in version 50. There's a few more fixes in version 51, which I think have got it uh, pretty much down pat. So pretty much any animated GIF should now reg render correctly in X lights. Um, fix no names. I, I don't know much about that. Uh, actually, I think I meant to delete these. These are just bugs. Um, uh, there was the value curve icon, we talked about that. The minus R command, um, so this is a command line option. There was, there was a post actually that, um, uh, that Sean put on the Facebook page that demonstrated this and provided um, some samples that you could use, a sample script that you could use. Um, actually, I, I do have one floating around here somewhere. Okay, build all, here it is. So basically, um, ignore the time command, that's just something that shows how long it runs. But you can run X lights using, in this case, a batch file with this slash R switch and list the XML file. And what this script will do is each line will run X lights. It will open up this sequence. It will render and save the FSE, FSEQ file, and then it will close down X lights and move on to the next one. So if you do something like a, a small uh, change to your network setup or a small change to your model setup, but you don't actually change your sequence and you just need all the data to properly re-render according to the changes in your models and everything else. Um, this is a great way to go through and just refresh all your FSDQ files, which of course you can then transfer over onto your Pi player and play. Um, like I say, there is a post on the official forum by, by Sean, which goes through and talks through that process. So I won't go any more into that. Um, and finally, um, oh, I know why I'm looking at the wrong one. Sorry. I oh, meant to be looking here. Uh, allow arrow key to be used to scroll model list in layout. Right, so that's um, that's here. So you can press the arrow key and move up and down through the models. Um, a couple other things I fixed. If you wanted to select, if I wanted to, for instance, select all of these snowflakes, I used to have to press the shift key and drag to go and select all of those snowflakes. Um, now, as long as you're not on top of a model, if you, which I was then, but if you're not on top of a model, you can, oh, yeah, this will be in 51. We're now in the 51 ones. So if, if 
I, if I, as long as I'm not clicking on a model, I can click and drag and highlight to select uh, models on here. As you saw in 50, you can't, you have to hold the shift key down in order to get it to do that. Um, in 51, you will be able to just uh, do that and you know, something crazy like delete all my models or something. Um, you can also, uh, you always could um, uh, click on a model he says, open, you can click on a model and use the arrow key to move it. Um, now with this, you can also highlight and select all those models. Oh, I somehow managed only to get one. And if you press your arrow key, you can see they all move together. Um, so you can manually move your models around. Uh, the only downside to it is the undo is not very useful. It works, but it's it's really slow. It un does it one move at a time. So that's all in 51, uh, rubber band selection. The big change coming up in 51 other than the FPP um, upload is some enhancements on uh, the network screen. All right, so okay, so some changes on the outputs tab. Um, nothing visual, it, it all looks exactly the same, but there are a couple of changes here. Uh, number one is if you double click on something, it now opens up the change screen, which I think is a much more obvious behavior. Um, rather than inactivating or uh, activating um, a, a particular controller. Uh, the other thing that you can now do is you can now highlight a, a, a batch of controllers and you can right click and there's now a whole bunch of right click menu items. So this is where your activate and deactivate sit. So if you want to deactivate a set of controllers, uh, you, you can right click and do that. It now also grays them out to make them much more obvious um, that these are inactive. Sorry, it's going to be a little bit slow because, like I said, it's debug. Uh, you can also highlight a, a group of controllers and delete them. Uh, whereas past, you either had to delete them one at a time or delete all of them. Uh, you can also go in and highlight a bunch of controllers and say, which is actually all the same controller, just different universes. And you can go to this bulk edit, and so I can bulk edit and add a description on all of those controllers simultaneously. So no need to go in and open each one up and type in uh, the individual. I can also go and say, actually, sorry, it's a little bit slow. I can also go in and say, actually, that IP address of 233, no, no, I've changed that. That's now 133 for that particular controller, and I just changed all of those universes at once without having to go back and re-delete them and re-edit them. I can also go in and, uh, and I can also change the number of channels. So I can go in. So if you've ever had that situation where you, you accidentally create all of your controllers as 510 or 512, and now you need to switch it to the other, and now you've got to go and either delete them all or add them all back in, you can go here and just select them all and do a channels change and go in and say, actually, no, they're all 510. Um, and it's gone and updated them all. And of course, all of your models and everything else will, will remap it correctly onto it. So, um, so they're all kind of useful. Um, that's the bulk edits, we've done the deletes. Uh, open controller, what this will attempt to do is this will actually try and open this IP address inside the browser. So if this controller is something that you are connected to and it's a controller that happens to have a web interface for configuration, it will basically open up that web configuration so that you can go and, um, and do stuff with it. Um, insert after, uh, this, is, this is actually exactly like these add buttons over here, but instead of adding the, the new controller to the end of the list, this will actually add that controller immediately after the controller that you've got highlighted. So rather than having to go and add a controller and then move it all the way up the list, which might be, in my case, I've got 98 universes or something here, you know, that's going to take a lot of time and it's going to get very frustrating. If I wanted to add a null universe, just there, it did it and it inserted it in exactly the right place. 
Um, the only one that's difficult is if I want to add one above number one, I actually have to add it below number one and then move it up a couple of times. But either way, this will be so much faster if once you get to muck around with your networks. If you've got a configuration that is more difficult than someone who just goes and blows it all away and just allocates a block of universes and doesn't worry about it, mine is, mine's quite a complex uh, controller configuration with lots of different numbers of channels set up. And so these things will save me a little bit of time when it comes time to play with it. And I think that's it. I think that is everything that has changed and is about to change in X lights between uh, version 47 and what will be, I believe, the the probably the last major production release. Maybe there'll be another production release really close to Christmas, but the, the amount of change in X lights has really started to slow down in the last few weeks. So I, I don't think you're going to see a lot of things popping out. Uh, all the guys are busy setting up their Halloween displays and, and obviously getting ready for their Christmas displays. And so they're not going to spend a great deal of time changing things between now and Christmas.